Hello and welcome to the February Pier into the Night. I'm Stina and we're here at the Maritime Pier this evening with all sorts of folks here to watch what's happening live underneath the dock. Rachel will be piloting our underwater drone tonight and we have some scuba divers as buddies and we will see what fantastic things we see. But for now, we're going to do a quick look at some of the awesome things we have in our touch tanks. Um, Adler really wanted to hold up this cool sea cucumber. California sea cucumber. These are all animals that were just found underneath the dock. This is like a spiky hot dog related to things like our lovely sea star here. Um, so it's an echinoderm. That spiny skin is kind of all a facade on this one here. Um, and Adler, if you roll it over, yeah, perfect. You can see those suction cup tube feet that it has in common with those sea stars. There's also a couple tube worms. It looks like a mottled star. Walk over here. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, I, we'll see We'll see how, how well we stay connected. Um, but yeah, we have a graceful crab, which, and our fantastic crab, crab wrangler, Sarah, here. <laughs> Uh, we have a red rock crab. He's shy. Uh, he's, he's being shy, <laughs> but they have the dark tips on their pinchers oh, wow. compared to this one, which is often confused with the Dungeness crab. But if you look at that um, last point, you can see there's a notch right under the glare, um, just beyond its shell. So right there is our clue that it is indeed a graceful crab. And then we have some fantastic stars, a leather star and an enormous ochre star. And it's got some cool, I guess it's kind of hard to see now that it's all snuggled in the corner, but look at that nub. All right, Rachel, are we ready to go live for Peer Into the Night or what? Great, I'm gonna hand our <laughs> camera over to Jack here, who's a blast from our volunteering past, and he's going to be our cameraman for the evening. So. All right. Thanks, Jack. You're going to aim for Stina and Vesprina. All right, I'm going to stage up over here somewhere. Perfect. Hello, everybody. First off, can we give a big round of applause to our fabulous volunteers who are here tonight? This includes two of our awesome interns. Valeria and Kat in the back. Um, we have Jack tonight who is streaming to Facebook Live. So hopefully we see some really cool stuff this evening uh, and we'll, you know, have the evidence to keep it later. So <laughs> great. Um, and then we have Rachel who's going to be piloting our underwater drone. Uh, she's going to be in the back. And I think she, are you going to be mic'd up at all? Do we get to talk to you? Okay, we're not talking to Rachel at all tonight, um, <laughs> but sometimes we do. Uh, and then we have our fantastic scuba divers. We've got Darnell here uh, and Jim, who's already in the water uh, and who found our lovely touch tank creatures this evening. So, yeah, big round of applause to our scuba divers. Okay, now we like to kick these off um, by talking about our divers. Uh, and so... Darnell, we're going to compare you to a marine mammal. It's nothing personal, but uh, it's kind of cool that us little human mammals can go exploring in the Puget Sound, which ranges from about 45 degrees to 55 degrees in the summer, which I don't know about you, but raise your hand. Has anybody gone swimming in this lately? Any polar plungers? No? Nobody? Uh, okay, Jack's a polar plunger. Great. It's cold. So... Um, oh great, we have Jim here too. Um, I'm gonna snuggle over here. Maybe behind this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but okay, we have our divers. How do you guys stay warm? That's what I want to know whenever I'm doing uh, programs in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so that's like the most uh, common question. So right now we're both wearing dry suits. Uh, they keep us warm and underneath we have long johns underneath it. So uh, like right now I'm actually sweating. I'm a long john. Oh wow. So, um, yeah, we're able to keep everything inside. Like in my pockets, I got the keys, wallets, and things like that. It all stays dry and warm. Perfect. Yeah. If you're like me and really don't like cold, you can wear a heated vest, which is what I'm doing. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Essentially, you have your cozy pajamas 
And just like our coats are trapping air against our body, that insulation is going to keep our divers nice and cozy. Um, the brave divers, or maybe, I don't know, uh, there are some divers who use a wetsuit and their body temperature will warm up the water that's trapped against the, their skin with that tight neoprene. Um, but I would say the dry suit is definitely the way to go here in the Puget Sound. Okay, so staying warm is definitely important. Um, I think probably the most important thing for our scuba divers is breathing, right? How do you stay underwater for such a long time, scuba divers? I have gills. Gills. Okay, yeah, Jim is a <laughs> freak of nature, perhaps. I mean, for many reasons. We, uh, we all go there. No. We um, use what are called regulators or second stage regulators. That's these things. We have two of each, just in case one doesn't work correctly or our buddies doesn't work correctly. Um, attached to that big cylinder on our back. Nice scuba cylinder. Scuba cylinder or tank, which uh, provides us depending on the type of cylinder and the type of air consumption you have and how deep you go between half an hour and an hour and a half of bottom time. Again, it varies based on how deep you go, um, how how good or bad you are at air consumption, things like that. There's some nice physics involved. We yeah. won't go into that for you tonight. But yeah, um, so we have to carry our air with us. I know there's two important first rules of scuba diving. Rule number one, always breathe. And rule number two is don't run out of air, so kind of go hand in hand there together. Um, I know now I, I did, I forgot I was comparing you to a marine mammal. Um, so the insulation, marine mammals have that nice thick layer of blubber. Um, our marine mammals have usually blowholes if you're a whale or a dolphin. Uh, seals, you know, pop up, breathe through their nose and mouth. Uh, so got that covered. Um, I know, unfortunately, we're not like torpedo shaped and streamlined like our lovely marine mammals. Um, so how is it that you power yourself and move through the water? Your turn. Uh, we use uh, our fins right here. Nice. So a little bit uh, less uh, thickness. You may kind of want to move out the frog a little bit. Yeah, that kind frog kick. <laughs> it's still a little flight, uh, flutter kick and it helps us move. Yeah, and that's especially important here because uh, you'll notice probably our drone more than anything is going to be the thing that like will get too close to the bottom. And in a harbor like this, we don't get a ton of water movement and so it's pretty silty. And so often we'll, you know, if we get uh, disturbed the bottom, you'll get that big woof of the sediment. So uh, that frog kick that you mentioned is pretty key for that. Um, let's see, how do you see underwater? Unlike marine mammals, we don't have the cool adaptations on our eyeballs to like the bat signal. see through. <laughs> the bat signal. Ooh, maybe seeing and communication. Can you touch on that? Yes. Yeah, so we, even in the daytime in the Pacific Northwest, you um, always carry a flashlight because even when it's beautiful out and bright, it can get really dark really quick in the water, in the emerald waters of the Pacific Northwest because there's so much light in every drop of water. It's really green. So we always carry one, and we usually carry a backup, which both me and my buddy have on our in our dive pockets. We both carry a backup light. And we also, at night, especially, use these to communicate. Like, if I want to tell him I'm okay, I do a circle. If I tell him something's wrong, I do just a flashing line. Um, or we'll just, like, flash the side of our masks to get our buddy's attention, and they'll look over. And then we will, like, put the flashlight down away from them and do a hand signal to tell them whatever whatever thing we want to tell them. I'm okay, I'm not okay, look at that fish. Shark look, behind you. Because there's shark behind you. <laughs> Peace out. Um, <laughs> you know, things like that. Like just now I would have given him this signal, which is not the rude thing you think. It's actually a signal for lingcod, which there's a big one of underneath that wreck right now. Um, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to get to see it because I had to invert to actually see it under the wreck. So I was upside down looking at it, but there is a, about a three and a half foot long lingcod under the wreck right now. Awesome. Okay. Oh, <laughs> cool. Perfect. Lingcod um, are smart. And then of course our divers also have uh, those scuba masks and that traps a little bit of air between uh, their eyes and the lens and that lets them see through the water and also lets them equalize their ears because as you go down, those air spaces get pressurized so you can kind of plug your nose to get your ears to equalize. Um, of course, as they're breathing, that's helping their lung spaces. Um, marine mammals have some pretty cool adaptations to like 
collapse parts of their body so they can stay, you know, hold their breath for a really long time. Um, so uh, let's see, what else do I want to kind of touch on communication? Um, back on the air subject, um, one thing we might have you all try to do is show us your gauges to the camera. Um, and so that kind of keeps track of their time underwater as well as how much air they have. Right. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, so those devices are going to keep our divers on top of kind of those things that are happening so they can stay nice and safe while they're diving for us tonight. Um, divers, anything else you want to share with us before we send you into the salt water? Um, I just saw seven different kinds of fish, three different <laughs> kinds of um, um, crabs, three different kinds of stars, and like so much life on the just Okay, well, I think you are all in for a treat. We're going to let our divers go get set up. Um, so thank you. Give a round of applause to them. If you do have any questions about the scuba side of it, my card is over there on the table with everything else. Feel free to call me or text me with any scuba-related questions. I'm always willing to answer scuba questions. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Boom. Alright, well, the hard questions are watching you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect! Yeah. Awesome. There's no such thing as a used to be, there's just somebody who's on a long surface. There you go. Alright, All right. thank you, divers. Um, while our divers get ready, uh, does anybody in our audience uh, have anything they hope to see? Yeah, it's like. Uh, I haven't been paying attention to this side of the screen. It seems like it's floating around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the drone is in the water and that's what has the camera. It has a little light on it. And so that will be <laughs> piloted by Rachel. Um, we will say every once in a while the current does weird things. If she's like, like woo, going all around, it's not her. It's the current. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, um, and I'm of course happy to take any questions as we go along, and I also just want to remind you that this is Harbor Wild Watch, not Harbor Wild, be miserable, so if at any point during this presentation, don't feel bad if you got a piece out. Um, I will say, if you want to stay in tune with what Harbor Wild Watch is up to, signing up for our newsletter, <laughs> you can weasel your way under right next to the Fancy House. We'll be opening again with all things. Salish sea sharks, so maybe we'll see a six gill or a spiny dogfish. Um, there's, there's some really cool species over there. I heard octopus over here. That would be pretty fun to see. Uh, we have the giant Pacific octopus, which is something we have actually seen at this site before. Um, it's the world's largest octopus species. Did anybody cross the Narrows Bridge to get here? Yeah, there's the lore that live underneath the bridge, which they probably do, but they live here too. They live all over the Pacific Northwest. Awesome! That is so cool. Uh, and then the, the little, the Pacific Red Octopus is another species we have that's a little smaller, and they have little tabs that look like eyelashes, so one kind of cool way to tell them apart. Cool. We'll just kind of get our technology figured out. How about anybody else? Oh, yeah. Looking Oh, you're good. Don't worry about it. Oh, you're fine. There's all sorts of great dive sites in this area. I've done the narrows one. Yeah, kind of like on the gate harbor side under the bridge. Nice. So we have both the Stellar Sea Lion and the California Sea Lion. Um, I forget which one's the more common one. Uh, I'm gonna have to look at the California California sea lion. But we do get both of them. Um, yeah, and they you can kind of tell the sea lions apart from the harbor seals. Um, one that the sea lion's much larger, uh, and they kind of have that like big <laughs> kind of protruding forehead. Whereas the harbor seals are more like a little passage with a head. Uh, and then if they're on land, like the, the harbor seal is just going to blob along. Whereas the sea lion kind of has more of like a dog-like. Uh, 
sharing us. Uh, but that sea cucumber that we are kind of catching little glimpses of, they look really spiky. Um, but if you get a chance, pet it, it feels like jello. They're like a gooey little blob. Do, do you agree that, yeah, jello, jello feels like? Um, yeah, they, they're a relative to the sea star and that echinoderm family or phylum. And uh, they have that spiny skin, is the phylum that we're in. And they have the suction cup too. Really cool power or to regenerate lost organs which in the case of the sea cucumber um, is one of their defense mechanisms. They'll actually squirt their guts out in the face of a hungry predator and those guts can be sticky and irritating and kind of, you know, distract the predator while the sea cucumber crawls away and can then regrow some of those internal organs. That's pretty cool. And they're edible, yeah. yeah. So, so California is definitely a hot ticket Is it a little, like some type of gunnel maybe? Um, 
So a lot of times when we're out on the beach, uh, you can roll rocks and it looks like there are little eels under the rocks, which they're not the true eel, because we're, we're too cold up here in the Pacific Northwest for true eels. Uh, but we have eel-like fish and they're, the way you can tell they're true fish is they have the pectoral fins. Um, and so that little guy kind of poking his head out of that tube there, um, which is either some type of tunicate or sponge. Um, yeah, get, a, get a good look. But I would guess some type of gunnel or prickleback. Again, hard to tell when it's, you know, gone now. Uh, but we have a couple of different species of, of lots of fish that look like eels. Uh, one of the biggest is the wolf eel. Uh, and they're like, you can get, I think, nine feet long. They're a big blue, kind of like grumpy looking grandpa fish. Uh, and they have the crushing molars for eating sea urchins, which is kind of cool. Oh, I think we might have caught a little glimpse of a chitin. I don't know if they'll go back to that. But an eight plated snail. I don't think we're going to go back to the chitin. Uh, we also have a lot of chitin species in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the biggest one being the gumboot chitin, which is like the size of a Nerf football. And they <laughs> just look like a, uh, I think Rachel called it, so it's like the, the moving meatloaf. Uh, the wandering meatloaf, thank you Rachel. Um, that purple that we're seeing is a shell of a crab or a carapace. And then oh, the shrimp is right there. <laughs> yeah, this is the shrimp. I'm trying to see if I can see if it's antennas are striped or not. Yeah, it's moving. It's a live yeah. Like, see that glow of the eyeball? <laughs> Shrimp have a really reflective eye when the diver's light shines on them. Now we're on to something. This one, Mommy. Is it not their kite? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can see. Yeah, those eight. It has eight plates. Um, so unlike the twirly shelled snails, or the limpets, um, the chitons have eight shells that kind of articulate, and then their big foot whoop, will help suction to the surface. So here it is, stuck to the rock. They come in all sorts of cool colors and varieties depending on the species. You know, not <laughs> not anymore. Not that I've seen. They're, I would hope there's some hiding somewhere, but that is not an animal that we catch a lot of. Kind of more in the street of one of you can see them on. Yeah, yeah so chitons are cool. They're very prehistoric, so uh, really, they've been, they've been on the planet for a long time. Oh, I saw a little crab leg. Yeah. Catch it. <laughs> Right 
Pretty cool. That's what the seeds are very cool. But yeah, um, I think. <laughs> My friend from Colorado demonstrated it nicely where we take the hairy part of your knuckles and on any of the sea stars, if you give them a little like knuckles, the uh, tiny little pinchers on their body will actually grab the hairs on your hand and pull on them. That is so purple. Uh, it's kind of a sponge yeah. And then the, yeah, the eight shells tighten nicely. Ooh, the contrast there is good. Yeah. It looks like it's just like not a bassoon. It really does. That's a tinia tighten. Common names are great because they can kind of say whatever. Uh, but yeah, but uh, sponges are also animals, believe it or not. Uh, they are kind of our most primitive marine invertebrate. Uh, there's some species that you can actually and those little cells will be organized into funny shapes. Um, okay. I doubt we have rock scallops in the harbor, but they are in like the south now. Um, and we also have the spiny pink scallops. There's a ochre star. Um, this is the same species of the big purple star that, that I recommend, you know, getting the little <laughs> finger pull, finger hair pull. Um, and uh, just to kind of wrap that thought up, uh, when you feel that pinch on your finger hair, oh no, uh, I think we got disconnected. Um, but that is the sea star protecting its gills from things like barnacles or seaweed from settling on its body. Because um, they have those dermal gills, or gills on their skin, and so if it was covered in stuff, it wouldn't be able to breathe very well. well they lost the same Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna plug our camera back in. And we're back. Alright. Ooh, is that more fun? I wanted it to be a lemon dude brown. Or a sea lemon. It kinda has the right the right idea, but not not quite. <laughs> Red algae here. Uh, we don't have as much seaweed in the winter time just because there's not as much sunlight. Less sunlight and have less ability to photosynthesize and grow, but there's still a little bit here and there. Uh, and red is one of kind of the categories. We also have brown and green algae. Uh, we like to say, you know, green is always green, which makes it easy to identify. Brown is brown unless it's green. And then red is red unless it's green or green or brown. So that we, it can be complicated, but uh, Rachel and I can nerd out on seaweed a lot. Of if you ever want to see me walk, we got you covered. Thank you. Thank you nice meeting you. Did you learn and have fun? Yeah, fun. Right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, we're back live. And it looks like... It's kind of impressive uh, the amount of shell debris in this area. Again, that diver signal. Like, hey, look over here. So, get a glimpse of what, what they're looking at. Uh, that big piece of brown is a, some of that brown algae. This is sugar kelp. Um, kind of you off those, right those two uh, wibbly lines. You're like, what's the word for those, right? Mutilations, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of vocabulary. Kelp is one of those important habitats that's in the Salish Sea. Um, which if you're like, wait, what's the Salish Sea? Uh, the Salish Sea is the Puget Sound, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the Strait of Georgia. And these are all uh, bodies, all three of those bodies of water together uh, are the Salish Sea, which kind of harkens back to the people who have been in these places before us and uh, are the keepers of this land. So the Coast Salish tribe. And, oh, we have a perch. Um, not a 
Shiner perch. I'm forgetting. Oh man, I know. This is exciting. We don't normally. Uh, yes. Yeah, Every says it's in my office. Book out for that one, but it's in the perch group. Uh, we'll call it the punk rock perch. It kind of has that extra spiky <laughs> dorsal fin. Let it be known, there is a net here, uh, and then a uh, diver group will come and retrieve that net, because it can definitely be an entangling problem for our marine life, um, although right now it's looking like a lot of habitat, uh, but I think unfortunately those nets, when they're not connected to a human on the other end, they do what's called ghost fishing, and so uh, especially in the case of like, bigger animals, they can get stuck in that net. There's a nice, uh, a beautiful red rock crab, kind of that brick red color, giving me that clue. If we get a look at its pinchers, it'll have black tips on those pinchers. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're getting to the, we're in crab town, folks. <laughs> kids will be like, ah, the crab bit me, uh, or pinched me, or no, bit me, it's pinching, or it's their heart. <laughs> if it, um, they would never bite you because those little mouth parts are so delicate um, and tiny, but you can see them kind of fluttering along, around underneath the crab's eyes there. Not likely to bite you. Uh, sometimes what's actually most surprising is how pointy the crab's toes are. Uh, so often it's not even that you're getting pinched, you're just getting poked. There's a nice star. 
another model star. I think a lot of this kind of like drab brownie color and oh, oh it's Bonnie. It's Bonnie. Oh, oh, oh but, <laughs> this is a great it's example. Free, of is it, it's February. <laughs> <laughs> appear into the night, you know, where you, you, you don't get, you stay nice and dry, uh, but at least we don't get salty. Okay. I don't know, I might still get salty. <laughs> there. All right, look at that. What is happening? What is happening? I'm like, is that a spiny lump of Because I would be so happy, but it looks like a tail. It looks like a piece of dead kelp that's creeping to the bottom. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, biologists, we don't, we get stumped. Oh, actually, a lot of the time we get stumped. Yeah. But we sure do love pictures and questions of like, uh, if, rather than the, hey, what's the weird blobby thing on the beach? If you can send us a photo, we love um, answering your your mystery questions. So, what cool things are you finding? Yeah, you can always shoot us an email, info at harborwildwatch.org, or you can um, message us on our Instagram or Facebook account. Is Chesapeake Bay, uh, but I think 
ours is, I think the the fact that we're carved by glaciers. Oh, we get Jerry Brock eggs. We get a really cool. Probably a carved egg. Yeah. Um, but there's kind of a brown little lump that uh, camouflage really well with. I don't know how to fold it up yet. Like maybe. Excuse me. Oh, you're good. Oh, you're okay. They're about as big as your thumb. Okay. And they just crawl around. They blend in with particles very well, and they just eat them slowly. Uh, this time of year, they're mating and laying eggs, and so we often see. on a tropical dive, she cut her finger on a piece of coral, um, and that's a tunicate, that's, that's really cool, cool. <laughs> um, but I was like, oh my gosh, she's bleeding green, like my friend's an alien, because um, that red was gone, and she's still here. Um, so these little clear uh, vase-like creatures are called tunicates, they are your closest living invertebrate relative, they have in their um, larval stage a note that just fails to develop. So they almost could grow and have a brainstem, um, only they go the other way with it. They get less complex as they mature. Um, but as a larval, they look almost identical to human embryos in the first couple of The two worms are within reach and you can reach down. And even before your finger touches them, you'll probably notice that blue will suck back into the tube. <laughs> it's my favorite thing when, uh, the first people who come into the touch tanks in the morning, they get to touch the touch the two worms and they always scream. <laughs> They're like, oh, what's the thing? <laughs> and then, of course, those two worms also offer lots of good structure. So you can see um, on those like kind of straw-like things, there's a lot of other life, like the tunicates, and then like <laughs> that red seaweed that we just passed. These are the Bill Trump uh, pipes. That's what that swoopy big uh, round thing was. Also good habitat because it kind of sits out there and catches all the current. The harbor itself doesn't have a ton of current, but it does have some tidal fluctuations. The tide is either coming or going. Um, and we have two high tides and two low tides twice a day. So uh, it does shift the water around throughout this basin. It's not a super deep channel. Oh, there's a little nice green brook right yeah. here. Did you guys get any water inside when it was like, uh, the king 
Oh, yeah. It is not in our building, um, but the net shed got about a foot underneath the water. Um, it came all the way up off the dock and nearly reached the bathrooms on that side. Uh, so yeah, that, that was a, a very strong king tide, a pretty anomalous event. That was the highest we ever seen it. We had yeah. dogs go right up on the bulkhead on, right next to the hot tub. Yeah, yeah, it was huge, pretty dogs crazy. Dogs don't go that high. You know what I mean? That's yeah. like really high. Yeah, and that was a combination of um, a very wind. high tide anyway, so the sun and the moon were pulling in the same direction, causing higher than average and, and lower than average blowing, tides. So was there was the really bigger. low barometric yeah. pressure, so the pressure yep. of the air on the water was really less, and so it kind of allowed for, um, think of like a syringe, if you pull up on the syringe, you're going to draw water upwards, and that's kind of how um, the barometric pressure worked. And then we had all that rain and snow the week prior, so there was a lot of fresh water that was flooding down into the basin that is the Puget Sound as a part of our watershed, and, it was and all that combined just made for like, I think it's 2.4 feet above the average, above the predicted tide for that, uh, that day. So the crabs actually really love to hang out underneath the docks because those two worms eventually will lose their hold on the dock as they grow um, quite large and there's lots of things growing on them. All that weight pulls on their little tiny um, kind of glue that they use when they first settle out as a larva and eventually they will fall to the bottom and then the crabs can access them and consume them. There's a big barnacle, open barnacle. Um, Crabs are pretty good Another generalists. The hey. crabs are great at grabbing um, just about that. anything. We saw that they have those really powerful claws. Um, they have a really acute sense of smell, so quite often they will find the recently dead things out there in the bay, um, which is how humans capture them, right? We put something stinky in a crab pot, and they find their way right to it. So um, we can kind of use their adaptations to our advantage. Unfortunately, the Red rock crabs and Dungeness crabs in our area have had a really drastic decline in recent years, so crabbing is not open in this area um, in an effort to try to allow those populations to rebound. Oh, look at that little shrimp. That's a really beautiful popper type shrimp. Um, it has a really kind of broken back to it, um, which is their other name. The crab could eat it, but I think the crab is like, what is the right thing? It's, it's nighttime. That's great. So this is a great comparison of the difference between shrimp and crab because they are very similar. They have almost all the same body parts. They're just arranged a little differently. So um, the shrimp are kind of elongated, whereas the, uh, the crab shape is like if you took the tail of the shrimp and folded it up and underneath. So that abdominal flap where the females are carrying eggs essentially the tail of the shrimp, um, just arranged in crab shape. Shrimp also have long antenna uh, so that they can feel and sweep behind them and uh, watch out for predators there. Crab have their antenna at the very front of their face so that they can, oh, that's uh, that more duties. with like a 
with those. There's a 20 and a 30. And then there's a bunch of numbers at the bottom. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I get part of
have no swim bladders. Cricklebacks also have no swim bladders. Typically, they're max. Did anybody have any pressing questions? Again, some of you wish you uh, had answered for me. All right, friends. Well, I'm going to turn off our speed and give our uh, our divers the signal. But that's because we haven't been sampling it. Uh, the public access there is closed. And so, since we can't get there, uh, and we're gonna assume that not many people there are recreating. So, checking those those active sites. Saying hi to the geese flying in. More, more cool birds to see. Uh, so wherever you are, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, go on your own adventure, go wonder, make some observations. We also, you know, like those notices, stay warm, even though it's April. Uh, don't get caught in the snow or the hail or whatever other weird weather is happening. Uh, and if you do go recreate in the Puget Sound, uh, feel free to check out the Blue Water Task Force website again and check those water quality results because more information is always a good thing here. So uh, thanks, Mary. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and your questions and comments. and and general Harbor Wild Watch love. Uh, we'll catch you for the last Blue Water Task Force Tuesday in May. Oh.